I am a believer in history. I think history tells a lot about the present. <coughs> and history is also um, a guide towards the future. And I believe that, that this ASEAN vision, the vision of an ASEAN community, and this new vision, which actually is not a new vision, it's a continuation of the ASEAN vision, it didn't come out of the blue. It, it, is, uh, it reflects the evolution of ASEAN. And so to understand the evolution of the ASEAN vision, I think we have to go back to understand the, the evolution of ASEAN. And there are some very important milestones uh, from my point of view. 19, it began in 1967, the Bangkok Declaration. Even though the Bangkok Declaration was not referred to in the 2025 vision. But there, we talked about a politically cohesive ASEAN. We talked about ASEAN pulling our weight, making our collective presence felt. We talked about, to some extent, being the master of our own destiny, safeguarding our security interests in the midst of the Cold War. And then we had 1997 when Indochina fell to communism. So we had a new situation. We, had, we came up with the TAC, Treaty of Amity and Cooperation. That was a code of conduct for Southeast Asia. How do we live together? How do we coexist peacefully together in the midst of you know, diversity? And I think for me, the 3AC was in a way sowing the seeds of the Southeast Asia 10, united in security, bounded by peace and prosperity. Then we had the end of the Cambodia conflict. Another landmark event was 1992, 1993, in fact, after the ASEAN free trade area. And so we began on the course of economic integration with AFTA. And then the real vision, I think, came with the summit in Malaysia, 1997, after the financial crisis. We had the ASEAN Vision 2020. Even though we didn't use the term community, but we did talk about the three pillars a uh, community, you know, living in uh, ASEAN, living in peace, bounded by common prosperity, and importantly, a caring and sharing society. So, the caring and sharing, caring and sharing society is really the beginning of this people-centered, people-oriented concept that we now embrace today within ASEAN. And then, of course, we had the Bali Concord two, 2003 which formalized the ASEAN community. And then we had the Cebu Declaration, 2007, which seek to accelerate the realization of the ASEAN community. And then another hallmark document, the Charter, the ASEAN Charter, which I was privileged to be a part of at the beginning, before I became, went on to be ambassador in Geneva. There we talked about ASEAN being a rules-based organization. And then we had the um, 2009 Sha'am, which is Sha'am is uh, in Thailand, uh, in Hua Hin, Sha'am roadmap to the ASEAN community. So this is the blueprint. How do we get to this being a community? And then, of course, we had the Bali Concord Three which exp expanded the, our aspiration to be look beyond ASEAN, to contribute to global peace and security, to be a responsible player in the international community, to help the international community address global challenges. So what, what I'm trying to say is that the ASEAN vision is an accumulation of the vision that has been evolving through the years when ASEAN began, since ASEAN began in 1967. And so this vision that uh, 
you know, in, the, in that book that uh, Ambassador Ong showed you, is not a new vision. I remember when they had the Nepidor Declaration establishing the HLTF, they said that our task would be to, to draft a vision that would be bold and visionary. But if you look at what the, the documents that are contained in the vision, there's really nothing bold and, and visionary. Because the next chapter, the next 10 years, is really a continuation of this ASEAN vision, a consolidation of the ASEAN community building process. And what we tried to do was try to find a clearer pathway a cl and to provide ASEAN with the means towards fulfilling the, the goals and objectives that we have set out in the, in the vision of an ASEAN community. And of course, we had 10 meetings all together among us. We opened up the space for stakeholders to be part of the process, even though I felt that we should have done it early on, you know, because they could contribute a lot to the process of drafting the Vision 2025. We met with CSOs, we met with academia, we met with IPA, the ASEAN Interparliamentary Association. We met with ICHA, the ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights. We met with the CPR Commission of Perm Reps in Jakarta. We met with the other pillars. So we came out with, I think, a fairly impressive document, at least in terms of the size. You know, you had the Bangkok Declaration, you have the overarching vision, you have the vision for each pillar, and then you have the blueprints for each pillar. But then I think people ask me, why, why didn't you try to stretch the envelope a little bit? Why, are there, why didn't we break some new grounds? I, I think we have to accept the realities within ASEAN. You know, and of course, the vision is in responses to the changes that have taken place within ASEAN, changes that have been outlined by Ambassador Kong. Ong. We are more integrated. Our relations have become more complex. Our areas of cooperation have expanded, touching, touching upon all aspects of lives and livelihood of the people. And there is rising expectations on the part of the people of ASEAN to be a part of the community building process. And then the region and the world has changed as well. Um, you know, we, the Cold War ended. The world moved from being a unipolar world to a multipolar world. We had the financial crisis. Now we have the rise of Asia. We have the rise of China. And most importantly, we have this shifting strategic relations in East Asia and the Pacific that we have to contend with. And so that's the context that, uh, that our community building process is taking place. And we also have to, in the drafting of the, uh, the, the vision, 2025 vision, we also have to accept the reality of ASEAN itself. Well, first of all, ASEAN is not a supranational entity. We are still a collection of 10 sovereign states. We still believe firmly, or maybe not so firmly, in the principle of non-interference. We operate on the basis of consensus, meaning if it's a good day, we can hi have the highest common denominator, but most of the time, it will end up with the lowest common denominator. So, but, so we move at a pace that we say is comfortable to all. And so that's, that's the way ASEAN operates. And I think one limitation that, that we face also is that the HLTF is not the EPG. We're not an eminent person group. We're really a bunch of senior bureaucrats coming to the meetings with limited mandate, especially from our line agencies. And so 
correct me if, if I'm wrong, but what we hear very often in our meetings is, I don't have any mandate. I have to go back and consult my line agencies. So, so you have to understand the limitations and constraints that we face within the HLTF. You know, that's why sometimes maybe the, the product of, of our work may not satisfy everyone, but that's the reality within ASEAN, and that's the reality within HLTF. But having said all that, I, I think we did introduce some important new elements, or at the very least, reinforced or expounded on key elements. First, the element of people-centered ASEAN is found in all the three pillars. We talk about making ASEAN more inclusive, opening up space for stakeholders. I think that's a good thing. We talked about, um, we, we dealt, uh, we talked about um, a rules-based community based on shared norms and values. We identified these norms and values as being uh, democracy, it's there, human rights, good governance, rule of law, anti-corruption, compliance with agreements because that is one of the fundamental problems of, of ASEAN, the problems on how to ensure compliance with our obligations and agreement. I think importantly also reflecting the, the changes in the, in, at the global level, we, see, we sought to address the new threats to our security, the non-traditional security threats. So there you have transnational crime, transboundary challenges, irregular migration. We, we had um, human trafficking, even wildlife trafficking, climate change, and importantly, extremism and terrorism. So these are the common challenges that ASEAN confronts in terms of uh, security. And I, th I think if you really look at it, there is also an expanded part on maritime security and peace in the South China Sea. Because we recognize that it is in the maritime domain where the source of tension and instability in our region will come from. And we talked about ASEAN centrality. It's become a mantra you know, to talk about cent centrality of ASEAN, especially in shaping the regional architecture, which we hope will be still be driven by ASEAN, we hope. And then we talk about the outward looking ASEAN, you know, looking beyond ourselves, contributing to global peace and security, having common positions on important international issues. We, we didn't mention that in previous documents, um, making our collective presence felt in international fora. And for me, what I find most significant is the last part in the, in the chapter on the political security uh, cooperation, which is the need to strengthen the capacity, the institutional capacity of ASEAN. You know, the secretariat, our organs, our mechanisms, our work process, the, the role of the secretary general. I think we really have to look at that and how these institutions and how ASEAN can strengthen our capacity to achieve an ASEAN community. So I think these are very important elements that are contained in the ASEAN vision 2025. But I wanted to, what I, recalling our discussion, what I find most, um, enlightening was the fact that there were a number of issues which are not explicit in the vision, but very implicit th throughout the vision. I recall we had a discussion on what shall we do? ASEAN is now being more integrated. We become more independent. How do we manage this growing interdependence? among ASEAN, because events emanating from within 
can affect other member countries. And we're not talking about political situation. It could be like haze, pollution. How do we you know, constructively and in a timely manner talk about this issue without feeling offended, without feeling that we're violating this principle of non-interference? Second, I think this concept of a people-centered ASEAN is still something that we need to discuss more thoroughly. If you look at the, the, the vision, you see the word ASEAN people-centered followed by people-oriented. Sounds the same. People-oriented versus people-centered. People-oriented versus people. Sounds similar, but I think for many countries, they have very different meaning. A people-centered ASEAN more or less seeks a, an approach that we have a sort of more, more of a bottom-up approach where people have a greater say in how ASEAN decisions are made in ASEAN. But a people-oriented approach, the emphasis is still with governments. Governments, you know, addressing the needs of the people. So it's a top-down approach. So, but I think whether it's people-oriented, people-centered, the challenge here is how to open up space in ASEAN for all the stakeholders. We talk about uh, ASEAN benefiting the peoples, we, but we also say ASEAN, the peoples participating in ASEAN. So how can the people participate in the ASEAN decision-making process? I think this will be an issue that will still come up in the course of the next 10 years. And then, for me, having been SOM leader and having to deal with some of the immediate issues, the challenge for ASEAN, I think, is how do we respond in a timely manner and effectively to rapidly evolving situations and emergencies? Because 10 years from now, I still think that we will operate on the basis of consensus. But how can that consensus be shaped more quickly in a timely manner. So in the blueprint, I think there we talk about the role of the ASEAN chair. We talk about how to convene special meetings. And importantly, we talk about the ASEAN Troika. The ASEAN Troika is an idea that was initiated by Thailand in the year 2000. We thought that you know, it would help facilitate the, the process of achieving consensus among ASEAN. We did a paper on that, but eventually, uh, in accordance with the ASEAN way, that paper was watered down, and the only way that it could be activated was by consensus. <laughs> so <laughs> that put the issue to rest. But, but we have it back. It was introduced by Thailand, the ASEAN Troika, in the, in the Vision 2025. We have to see how we're going to operate it. Shared values and norms. I think what stands out is human rights. I, I was chairing the ASEAN high-level panel, drafting the terms of reference for, the, for AICHA. If you look at where we were and where we are now, things have, have not changed. We have not moved. We have not given a protection mandate to AICHA. We have, you know, and I think we haven't even decided on the review of the terms of reference of AICHA because it's mandated in the TOR that we t the TOR would be reviewed after five years of the establishment of AICHA. We still can agree on that. So I, I do hope that, you know, on in, insofar as human rights are concerned, we have to open up greater space. I was president of the UN Human Rights Council. All of us, members of the United Nations, we go to the council. We have to do our UPR report, Universal Periodic Review. We present our human rights situation to the council, and they criticize and they comment and they make recommendations. Why can't we do it among us? You know, so I, I think you know we really have to think you know very hard about that. And then the concept of centrality, because Ambassador Ong talked about the chief in strategic relations among the major powers, how things are changing. This is going to put a lot of pressure on ASEAN because we, you know, 
our centrality will be subject to test. So what are we going to do about centrality? And we haven't really had a very serious discussion about ASEAN centrality. We, Thailand did a paper on ASEAN centrality. We tried to lay out what centrality is all about. Centrality within ASEAN, centrality in our engagement with the major powers, centrality in the regional architecture, and centrality addressing situations affecting peace and stability of the region. So we need to continue discussion on centrality. And then it, what, another important issue, I think, regional architecture. The regional architecture has evolved. ASEAN, you know, we have ASEAN plus one, ASEAN plus three, we have ARF, ADMM, ADMM plus, and now we have the EAS, which I think a lot of people regard as the pinnacle of the regional architecture, even though we don't say it. So what we have right now is a multi-layered regional architecture, which ASEAN hopes to be the driving force. But we cannot be the driving force without some clarity as how all these pieces fit together. You know, they, they, it's not going to be a, a hierarchy, definitely, but we have to make sure that that uh, these pieces fit together and there's synergy in the interaction among all these pieces of the regional architecture. And a very important problem for ASEAN in the implementation of our com community building and when we had the, our work of HLTF it was also reflected as well, how to coordinate between the three pillars. We, we were the HLTF, the, the big HLTF, but the HLTF of, in the econ of the economic pillar, HLTF of the social, they operated on their own. So, you know, we had some discussion, but more or less they did their own work. And the, the, the document that we had in the end was not a consolidation, it was more or less a compilation. So there, it was lacking of, there was some lacking of coherence. But this is going to be a problem for, for ASEAN in the future when we deal with cross-cutting issues, connectivity, let's say, uh, disaster management. So how are we going to bring about more coordination among the three pillars? We have the ASEAN Community Council, but that's the foreign ministers, they don't have time. So we have to look more at the CPR. We have to task the CPR with the task of coordination. And then we have the joint preparatory meeting which is a meeting among the senior officials of the three pillars before the ministerial meeting, before the summit. But we only prepared the, the itinerary. So I think we have to do some coordination among the three pillars in the context of the JPM. And I'm happy to say that they decided to change the name of the JPM to the JCM, Joint Consultative Meeting. And lastly is the issue of constitu institutional capacity. So we really have to work hard on what do we do with resources? Can we ex increase the comp compulsory, compulsory contribution? Can we introduce voluntary contribution, the role of the secretariat? Oftentimes, and when we have meetings, we begin from, from uh, um, square one because the secretariat has not been able to provide us with the, the kind of support that we need. So I think these are important issues that uh, we, we need to address in the course of the implementation of the Vision 2025.